Good evening. Uh, it, it is evening for me, but good day to you. Um, and uh, it's uh, September the 24th, Monday, 2012. And uh, uh, basically, um, uh, we're talking to independents and third party candidates, people that you can vote for that aren't Republicans and Democrats, and that are people that are going to be on the ballots, that are legitimate candidates. And uh, today we have Steve Porter, who's running in district number three in um, PA, Pennsylvania. Um, his, uh, he does have some um, opponents here, and uh, one of them um, is Republican, one's a Democrat. Mike Kelly, the Republican, uh, Misa Eaton, the Democrats. Uh, Mike Kelly is the incumbent. He voted for the uh, Constitution, I, I mean, voted against the Constitution for the NDAA. Um, and I, I, just to start, th th make that an issue real quick, and Mike, um, I mean, uh, Steve might have other issues to raise here, but I would say um, it's not just the technology that makes the time that we live in great. Um, it, it, those, it's not just that kind of advancement. It's also the advancements in the you know types of laws that we have and, and, and things that we recognize, like the Constitution, that all unites us. And uh, so, um, uh, so he voted against that, I believe. Um, uh, I think it's um, I very strong-heartedly. And um, but uh, again, there is a new hope, um, you, you know, in this empire of illusion, w there's a hope for our republic again. And again, this is um, Thomas with libertarianprogressive.com. Um, Steve, uh, please tell us about yourself, um, what uh, motivated you to run this year uh, in 2012, and uh, a little bit about your district number three in Pennsylvania, sir. Well, okay, I'm 69 years old. Uh, I've been uh, a, a teacher all my life. Uh, have degrees in uh, fine arts and educational administration, uh, doctorate in fine arts, and a, what's called a PD degree uh, in educational administration. And um, and I've been teaching and involved in politics all my life. Uh, I'm running because the two major parties have become so corrupted by money that it is really impossible for them to work on behalf of the people. They have to work on behalf of the, uh, of the special interests who have paid them off. And we can talk about the amounts of money involved as we get uh, further into this interview, but they are trillions and trillions of dollars, uh, much more than any one candidate or any one population can combat. The only way to combat this is to vote for uh, third-party candidates who are going to be uh, working on behalf of people instead of on behalf of money. And that's what I am doing, well, trying to. We all have options in life, and it's good to know what those options are. And um, looking at your website, uh, Steve, which um, is Porter, P-O-T-E-R, the number four, Congress, C-O-N-G-R-E-S-S -S dot com. Right. And remember november 6th is election day um i, I figured that i'll you know, try to remember that <laughs> yes uh, for for well, for everyone else out there right. and um I, uh, it's i figured economics the budget might be one of you know the issues you'd want to go into uh, uh, looking over your website here and um uh, so what what is um we, we have problems and right now we're presented more we're we're presented problems for our problems and so um what do you say sir is some of our um solutions uh money wise well i think the first thing that i'd like to say before i get into that and i will get into it i'm not ducking the question uh is that 38 percent of american voters are registered independents that's according to the latest Gallup poll, which was done this year, and on March 20th of this year. And not a single one of the 435 members of the House of Representatives is an independent, which goes to show you how uh, skewed the electoral process is. And it's skewed because the state houses, which are controlled uh, either by Republicans or Democrats, have been paid off by so much special interest money, and now I'll tell you the number, and, and, and I'll give you the references for all of this. Uh, well, the Gallup poll has done a lot of good, I mean, good polls this year. Um, I, we, I have some reference at libertarianprogressive.com where Congress has a 10% approval rating and, and the media's approval rating. 
is um, at an all-time high um, uh, of uh, public distrust. Yes, it, well, both of those things are are true, and and uh, and I can go into the, the media uh, figure uh, in a little bit. But but it's fourteen uh, the, the fourteen trillion dollars has been given to campaign funds for Republicans and Democrats since 1990, and that figure comes from the Center for Responsive Politics. It's about all our debt, isn't it? It's, it's almost. almost equal to the national uh, debt, and it's almost equal to uh, the total of a year's worth of uh, gross domestic and, and product. where do those figures come from, sir? OpenSecrets.org. Okay. Uh, if you're near your computer, just dial that up, and it's the it, it's the website of the Center for Responsive Politics. They have only one function: to find out who has given how much to whom. And if you go on the industry by industry compilation since 1990, which is as far back as they post their compilations, and you add up all of the industries. Uh, it's uh, 14. It's it's almost 14 trillion dollars. It's 13.5 trillion dollars, and they have not uh, posted the uh, all of this campaign. I'm sure it's going to be 14 trillion by by the time this campaign is over. Well, I know. I don't know what anyone else might be thinking hearing that, but I'm just thinking, what a big waste of money. It's yes, it is. It is a terrible waste of money, considering that 70 percent of every campaign dollar is spent on some kind of meaningless 30-second soundbite. Uh, it, the, the issues aren't explained, the positions aren't explained, it, people speak in, uh, in ridiculous, meaningless generalities. Uh, but let me get back to let me get back to your first question, which was, what is my campaign about? I have uh, a, a six-point platform, which is I've thought out in great detail and with a great deal of research. Uh, and and by the way, this is this is not a plug, but people can find my research on my last in my last two books. The first of which is called Preserving America, and the second of which is called The American Covenant. Um, uh, I have advanced degrees uh, uh, for a reason, and that is to do the research before I do the writing. Uh, so that what I'm saying is uh, indisputable, according to the evidence that's I, I love that type of argument. I mean, I, if, if someone, like, if I'm reading an article or watching an interview or speech and, and someone, you know, just presents these facts with all the references and, and give these, um, like, just just by when, when you said, you know, the $14 trillion since 1990 was spent on campaigns, that leaves the listener to a lot in their imagination. Hmm, I wonder what that could have been spent for. I mean, that's that's excellent. Yeah, that's what we need more of. And I'll tell you exactly what it was spent uh, what what it was spent on. But uh, but you know, I'm going to say t to you and to your listeners now uh, what I've said all my life as a teacher, and that is, I don't want you to trust me. I I, I don't want you to trust what I'm saying. I want you to. Uh, go to the references and look it up and see that I'm telling you the truth. And when you see that I'm telling you the truth, that's when you should really swing into action. Um, and the truth about the money is on OpenSecrets.org. Uh, I've heard of them, yeah. And Thomas Jefferson um, it wisely, I think, said that um, you know an educated and informed public is necessary for a democracy. I mean, if if and I I would prefer to have a democracy that, that takes a little more maintenance um, than, y y you know, some kind of autocratic rule, personally. A absolutely. All right, so now getting back to my platform. Uh, th these six items will integrate to do the following things. They will make us uh, energy independent. They will stop the debt. They will uh, fix most of our economic problems and they will restore our democracy. Now, let me and tell they're you, they're not stuff we're going to hear from a Republican or Democrat. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, now, here they are in detail. Number one, we can cut the federal deficit year by year by hundreds of billions of dollars by simply returning to the tax codes of the nineteen of nineteen sixty. I'll elaborate on that, but I'm going to finish the whole list. Number two, we can eliminate the burden of health care and Medicare forever by passing H.R. 676, and I'll elaborate on that as we go along. Number three, we can 
instead of bailing out dishonest banks, use that money to create millions, literally millions, of uh, American jobs which produce clean, renewable energy, repair our infrastructure, and protect our national watershed. I can go into detail on that. Number four, we can get out of Afghanistan now. It costs us over $100 billion a year and many, many lives, our own soldiers and innocent civilians. If we get out now, we save $200 billion because the war is projected to go on at least another two years and probably thousands of lives, certainly hundreds of lives. Uh, the, the, the fifth issue is Social Security. We can make Social Security solvent forever and build up an enormous surplus simply by lifting the earnings cap. And I can explain that in detail if you want me to, I, I, and I would love to. And the last thing is that we can stop the system of legalized bribery and return our democracy to its integrity by funding elections with public tax dollars instead of legalized bribery donations. Right. Now, now that's the table of contents. You have a plan. Um, uh, how about let's just you explain them in, in reverse order. Um, and um, so let's start with the bribery. And uh, um, you, you know, and so yeah, there is a lot of bribery. There's a lot of uh, revolving doors. There's a lot of conflicts of interest. Um, and uh, we're not being r represented. Um, you know, that's fair to say. So. We're not being represented at all. And by the way, uh, just for your sake and much more for your listeners' sake, I'd like, I'd like everyone hearing this to know that these are not simply my opinions. First of all, uh, Bill Bradley, who was uh, a, a well-respected senator for 18 years from New Jersey, let alone a Rhodes Scholar, a Princeton graduate, and uh, a, a Hall of Fame basketball player with the New York Knicks, uh, Bradley has written a best-selling book called... Uh, uh, we can all do better. And he says exactly the same thing. We have a duopoly that's bought off. And the decisions of the Supreme Court in 1976 with Buckley versus Vallejo and in, and in 2010 with Citizens United has made money the equivalent of free speech, which is an asinine policy, and has even gone so far as to not only accept unlimited amounts of money, but money that's not even reported. And so our our uh, democracy, the American democracy, can literally be funded by a foreign nation that doesn't have to report its contributions and direct the course of, of, uh, of elections because people are going to look at the money and they're going to say, wow, look how much they raised, and they're going to be hit over the head 70% out of every dollar with sound bites that are meaningless to them, that don't spell things out. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, just common sense says, like, um, you know, we know who is going to be the nominee of the Democrat uh, convention this year because it's um, no one was running against Obama, really. And the and, and same thing for Mitt Romney. They could have given that $36 million plus the other $100 million that was spent for security directly to Habitat for Humanity or something, and they both probably would have looked like 10 times better for it, too. Um, so they're just very short-sighted. They're not seeing, you know, the forest past the trees, and it's just, you know, instant gratification and, and, and get rich quick instead of looking at, like, a long, steady, long-term, solid foundation-type system, you know, and, and just... Um, it's, I, even, it's even worse than that because there were people in the Republican Party who were running for president who were never represented because of money. I'll oh, yeah, you, Gary Johnson, Ron Paul. Um, that well, Ron Paul was a, running as a, as a Republican, but the person that I was thinking of was a guy by the name of Buddy Romer. And Buddy Romer, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, Buddy Romer was uh, uh, from Louisiana. He was a two-term governor. He was a congressman. He couldn't re run again for governor because they have term limits, and so he ran for president. You did not see Buddy Romer on a, in a single Republican debate, and that was because the Republican strategists, in cooperation with a very, very, um, how do I say it, undemocratic and unthinking media, made one of the qualifications for being in any of the debates the amount of money that you raised in a certain period before the debate. And Buddy Romer was not for sale. And, and they told Gary Johnson that he had to have a certain percentage in the polls, yet 
they didn't in include him in the polls to even get those percentages. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's the same thing. In, in, you know, there, there's a book written uh, called Grand Illusion by a lawyer by the name of Teresa Amato, and she documents state by state how the Republicans and Democrats have made it impossible for most third-party candidates to be heard, to get on the ballot, or to get into office. Um, if, for example, in Pennsylvania, where I'm running, uh, even though the 14th Amendment of the Constitution says that all laws are to be applied equally to all citizens, and the Constitution of the state of Pennsylvania says that elections shall be free and equal, though those are the Constitution's words, free and equal, these are the well. That's that's the exact argument I think Gary Johnson is using because I just read the other day that he's suing um, to get on the debates now. Yeah. Yes, good for him. Uh, and, and to to continue that argument here in my state, uh, if you want to run as a Republican or a Democrat, you need to get uh, a thousand signatures on your nominating petitions in order to uh, get on, onto the ballot. If you are anything other than a Republican or Democrat, if you're an independent, if you're a libertarian, if you're a right-to-life candidate, if you're, if you're a Martian, if you're any, a Green Party, anything, you have to get the following. 2% of the total winning vote in the last general election for that office. 2%. Trust me, it's a lot more yeah, than let me thousand. get my barf bag because that is really making me sick. And then if you look at the gerrymandered districts, it just shows how corrupt they are because usually like counties and blocks of area are like geometric squares and stuff. But these <laughs> gerrymandered districts, they just look like, you know, dripping wax and, and, yes. and, and, and weird shapes like that so they can get elected. I mean, nothing could be more obvious. I mean, yeah, we, we need it. The, the way right now, though, in 2012 for us to get accountability is um, you know at the house the, uh, the 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 founding fathers put in an emergency break in the Constitution called the House of Representatives, where every two years we can pull that emergency break, turn this car around, and you know throw out um, y you know those uh, robbers <laughs> that that hitchhiked and uh, call the Republicans and the Democrats. So um, so that's I think step one, and 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 then you know then the debate will begin when we actually can debate in the Congress and have some honest conversation. Yes. Well, uh, so, so much for uh, money and, 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 and its corruptive influences. You want to go back through the to the list of things that well, I Well, the last one was bribery, and I know the fifth one Social Security. So, I mean, so the, the, the elections, what about, you know, what about an election channel like C-SPAN, but have it like a government election channel, and it guarantees everyone equal time in debates. Um, all the candidates, like, you know, ha would have to appear, or they, they would have to appear on it just because it would be so well known. It should apply to all of the media, and it should apply because the media has a fiduciary responsibility to the public. Public. It uses the public airwaves, cost-free. It uses the public airwaves. Yeah, or to maybe make they money. should be, you know, say like, you know, you have to give at least an hour of the, uh, every other day or something to this candidate. In prime Equal, time. Equally to all candidates who are on the ballot. Yes, funding elections through public tax dollars and only public tax dollars, money already paid. All of us or score tax. voting. And what about score voting? Have you considered? I looked at that, where um, you know you can vote for who you think is like your first place candidate, which would be you. And then if I was, you know, voting because of fear for one of the Republicans or Democrats, I could put one of them as the second place. Um, and then that way you can always vote your conscience. And if for some reason a person your conscience doesn't win, it would fall back to the second one. I've thought about it, thought it to see if there's any cons to it. And I, don't, I can't see any cons to something like that, either. Uh, well, I don't know if it meets constitutional tests of, of uh, one man, one vote. Uh, I know certainly the Electoral College does not meet constitutional tests. Uh, and, and that should be, uh, that, that should be uh, amended immediately, because... Uh, well, I'm glad that's your criteria, too. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so just wrapping up in the bribery, if, if you know, can summarize that, and then into Social Security, Steve. Okay, well, uh, bribery is uh, public funding of elections, uh, equal uh, ballot access for the candidates, 
and uh, th there's there's much more that we can do with election laws. Uh, election day should be a holiday so that everyone mm -hmm. can go to the polls and vote. There should be nothing like uh, uh, a voter ID. It's easy to do this in the age of uh, computers and technology. You go into the voting booth. The voting machine takes your a retinal image of your eyes or a palm print or fingerprints. It identifies you without a name, simply by location of the machine, the state, and the number of the voter that you were that day. It prints out a record of your voting just like a supermarket. You get the receipt, and if anyone else in the country, after you vote, uses your retinal print, it, the, the vote is discounted, um, and, and, and since everyone's retinal image or fingerprint or palm print is unique to that person, no one can vote that's dead, no one can vote twice, it solves all of the fraud, fraud problems, and, and it does it by still keeping your name anonymous. That should be done also. All of that needs to be done. It needs to be done. If we're a legitimate democracy, let's make it a legitimate democracy. Well, I mean, even just going back to paper ballots, I mean, the electronic voting scares some people, and um, and some people, you know, might not want their retina. I mean, consider that a privacy issue, but um, I mean, I guess people could do still do mail-in ballots if they didn't want to do that. Or yeah, I, it, it, there's a million ways to protect against voter fraud. I don't know that, that a retina or a fingerprint would be uh, a privacy viol violation if there were no name attached to it. All you're trying to do is to make sure that only that person has voted. Uh, anyway, but we, this can be debated pro and con. There's much to do yes. to make this a, a democracy. We could start by public funding. And we should brainstorm, and we should be honest, and we shouldn't you, you know, um, avoid things because of fear. But then again, if we do fear something, we should have it honest, out and open, and, and really discuss and debate this issue and bring it into light. Yes. And that's, that's one thing we definitely are avoiding. Um, we certainly are in almost everything. Social Security. Uh, uh, most people know uh, that the, that you don't pay Social Security if your income passes in rough numbers a hundred thousand dollars a year. It's about a hundred and six, but let's use a hundred thousand. Uh, what that adds up to is that sixty percent of American income is earned by people who make more than a hundred thousand. Sixty percent which means 60% of the possible money from which Social Security could be drawn is never tapped for Social Security. If the earnings cap were lifted and everyone paid 6.2%, just like I did all my life, my income is, well, at, at the height of my earning power, it was around $100,000 a year. And and uh, and that was total income. That was not only what I was being paid to teach, it was also royalties from a lot of music and, and, and a lot of books. But in any event, uh, everyone should pay the same 6.2%. The rich shouldn't get a great deal. I'm a Yankee fan. I happen to love Derek Jeter. He gets he gets ten million dollars a year. He doesn't pay Social Security on nine point nine million of that. Why not? Why not? He can afford he can afford it. All of the fat cats can afford it. Okay, we so all, so if we did that, that would make it. Would, would that all, be all that we would need to do? Or uh, if we did that, and I've done the math, if we did that. We would accumulate by the year 2040 a surplus in Social Security of about $20 trillion. The income on the interest of that money alone would fund Social Security forever in perpetuity. Yeah, we could put, have, you know, it's surprising, and you might not believe this, but, um, I, or I'm just saying this in general, not you personally, but you believe it or not, in 19, I think in 98, Ron Paul, who's known as like, you know, Mr. Libertarian, he actually introduced a bill where um, Social Security, where, where you couldn't invade the the lockbox he was actually going to make a real lockbox for it right and he was also going to let it be invested in um, securities where it actually would get interest as well of 
course. And um, and so that's that might be so. so I, I think there's a lot of you know fervor out there on, on like left, right, all these different um, labels and stuff. But I mean, it just shows that he's he, he has a practical side, and it's kind of almost exactly like what you're saying, except that you would also make sure that everyone is like you know kind of a flat tax across the board. Uh, yeah. Well, that's yes. Anyway, that's that's the answer to the Social Security problem, and and, it, and it's an easy answer. It's an easy answer. The reason why all of, all of our problems have relatively simple solutions. That what makes it difficult is that the people in Congress don't want relatively simple solutions. They want solutions which hurt the people who don't pay them off and help the people who do pay them off. Oh, they're I mean they're oh. making deals that affect people's lives, that affect people's. Um freedoms um you know we have the highest incarceration rates in, in the entire world um so uh, they're you, you know they're, they're not being too thoughtful as, as far as you know the pursuit of happiness and um so social security solved and um no but before social security i think you said about um investing like like i guess what you're kind of referring to is like do you think the federal reserve should be under the treasury department so that you could invest in like your, your i think you were saying the fourth item was kind of rebuilding america in a sense well, the, get, making the, jobs the, the fourth item was leaving afghanistan oh leaving afghanistan i'm sorry uh, okay th yeah. that, that, uh, we we don't understand terrorism we don't understand what caused it, or maybe we do and we just don't talk about it, we don't understand the residue of hatred, not toward us, but toward, if I can use a generalization, the white western countries of Europe and their progeny. For the last thousand years, the history of the world has been the expropriation of people and resources from the colored human beings of the world by the white Western Europeans of, of, of the world. It's been going on since the Crusades. Um, and, and the strange part about it is that the United States has done the least of it, not the most of it. The real robbers have been England, France, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, all the people that sent out the ships and the Crusaders from Europe starting, you know, w with, with the year 1200. And, uh, and, and it's gone on for a thousand years. Uh, and, and the things that have been said about these people by American presidents are horrifying. If anyone reads the speeches of Theodore Roosevelt, you would... Woodrow Wilson. And, yeah, yeah, right. It, it, it's incredible. And what we have done is we have mistakenly wrapped ourselves in the cloak of colonial imperialism so that everything that we do in the world is looked upon by the poorest people in the world, by the most downtrodden people in the world, as a violation of their rights and a violation of their way of life. And that's why we are hated. And, and the thing I think we don't see in the big picture, um, like in a really big picture, is that we're, we're again being short-sighted and um, and we don't see how that comes back to affect us because all the policies that we're doing in Pakistan and et cetera, they're, they're starting to come back to the U.S. I mean, again, the, the highest incarceration rate, this surveillance society, um, you, you know, now we have instead of just a military industrial complex, we have a homeland security industrial complex as well. Yes. And, and, uh, and the amount of uh, human misery that we've caused to innocent people, displacing homes, killing civilians. Four million civilians were killed in Vietnam, a war that we never should have been fighting, never should have been fighting. Only at, on his deathbed did Robert McNamara finally admit in his last book that it was a mistake. To, to prosecute the war in in uh, in uh, Vietnam, that was a ten year war, ripped the nation. So apart. instead of going to war with these countries, I mean, um, we would have, and that here's one reason why a lot of the countries do like us because maybe we haven't done as much bad, well, recently maybe, but as much bad as some of the other countries. And a lot of these countries, they side with us, like in the UN, they 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 they're on our side. Um, and a lot of these small countries, and uh, and that that kind of gives us the moral arguments when we're negotiating and things like that. And um, and and so if we weren't invading them and bossing them around, like what what's the alternative? We could just either ignore them, I guess, or we could actually be friends with them. And, um, and we can't ignore their pain. 
that none of the world can ignore their pain. There, there, there are there are eternal truths. Or I believe there are eternal truths uh, that that govern things in the universe. And one of those eternal truths is the law of tension and release. Tensions will be released whether or not you actively release them. If uh, here uh, an example that has nothing to do with politics. There's a tension in every star. It's between the explosive force of nuclear fusion and the implosive force of gravity. Sooner or later, the tension between them is going to give out in the explosion of the star. There are tensions in our bodies. If we don't sleep, we will die. If The only way to, to reduce the tension is either to sleep or to die. But either way, you're going to redu reduce that tension. The tension will oh, yeah. go away. It's like um, John F. Kennedy's kind of um, philosophical formula. If those who um, make uh, peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And so it, what we ought to be doing with the other nations of the world, particularly those nations which were the progenitors of colonial imperialism, and the United States was not, I, I, I have to say that very forcefully, we were not the, 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 the worst uh, nation on the block, and we have been one of the most generous nations on the block to build back uh, enemies uh, after war, to contribute in aid to other countries. All of that is true. And when I see our flag burned, it makes me think what, what, a, what a horribly um, skewed view people have of us in comparison to the nations which really did the damage and contribute very little to, to the rest of the world. I mean, I don't know what Spain gives in foreign aid, but it certainly isn't anywhere close to the amount that they took out of South America in gold uh, during the age of the conquistadors. In any event, w one of the things that could be done is for the have nations of the world to get together and provide uh, the right funding to develop the have-not nations of the world. This is not only my opinion, this has been voiced by many great historians and by many great uh, leaders in our own Senate. I'm thinking uh, right now of uh, J. William Fulbright and what he did uh, with the Fulbright scholarships uh, in his own personal life, but also what he recommended in many of the books that he wrote. I'm thinking right now of the arrogance of power. Anyway, that's what, how we ought to be dealing with terrorism. We should not be sending drone missiles into states that hate us already. Yeah, and maybe more scholarships so that people, when they go back to their country, they'll have a good opinion about us, and then also they'll be more skilled as well, I suppose. It, which was the whole purpose of the Peace Corps, and, and, uh, and also... Uh, something that we ought to be doing instead yeah, of... Things like that can have a huge impact. I mean, I don't think people, you, you know, even for libertarians, I don't think that would be like the top of their, uh, you, you, you know, chopping list or whatever. So it's, um, I, yeah, I, I mean, that, that, that would be great. Um, you, you know, become friends with these countries, trade with them, and, uh, you know, have some fun and, and, and uh, you know, maybe a new renaissance, like have live life, like, you, you know, beyond just the, the, the small spectrum of um, endless war and, uh, and, and greed and corruption. And, um, and, and needless war. And, and, and war in, in Afghanistan, not to protect the people of Afghanistan, but to build trade relations for a country that is mineral rich under the ground and whose leader is one of the largest uh, drug dealers in the world. Yeah, maybe a war against gravity. We can invest more in space and uh, things like that. Um, so, uh, all right. So now, I guess now, uh, I guess we're we're at Social Security now. No, no, we did oh, Social okay. Security. Oh, we did. But, I, I'm but sorry. You're I'm going sorry. backward. Now, now, uh, now we're at uh, uh, at uh, alternatives to bailing out right. dishonest banks, right. and and this is where uh, and this is where the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street unite. This is where everyone in America, according to the polls didn't think we should have bailed, um, you know, all the people in 2008 and beyond out. Yes, and, and uh, there, there is a reason for that, and it goes back to where we started, and that's campaign contributions. If I uh, told you $14 trillion, how much of that you think was given by the finance industry? It's a rhetorical question. I'm going to answer it for you. $2.8 trillion, trillion dollars, was given between 1990 and now by the finance industry in order to buy off 
the major parties, both major parties. And by the way, when I say buy off the major parties, I'm not talking about one party as opposed to another. That $2.8 trillion, and you can get this once again, don't trust what I'm saying. Go to Open Secrets, look it up for yourself. It's 55% Republican, 45% Democrat, almost an equal amount. Well, of course, when that kind of money is being given to both sides of the aisle, when the banks are in trouble, they're going to expect to be rescued by our tax dollars because that's what they paid Congress to do. So what happens? We spend $600 billion bailing those crooks out. No one except Bernie Madoff, to my, to my knowledge, has gone to prison over, over the scandals of the savings and loan No, they probably people. got bonuses instead. Yeah, right. Or, or they got promoted to Secretary of Treasury. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and what, and, and what, uh, what could have happened with that money, what should happen with uh, QE3 now, uh, is we should be using that money, partnering with private industry to create jobs, building uh, clean energy, wind and solar energy, doing nuclear fusion research, doing biochemical energy research, and uh, protecting our watershed. I don't want to pump oil from Alaska to Texas. I'd like to pump water that, that floods the, uh, the, the, the Mississippi Valley w when it rains too much into areas of drought where uh, people can't grow crops. I did some math too, and um, and I forgot exactly how much trillions it was, but it was like about I don't know about eight, I don't know maybe twelve trillion, and um, there's about three hundred million, three hundred fifty million people in the United States, but there's about a hundred and let's just say one hundred fifty million households out of that three hundred fifty million. So. We could have, um, instead of bailed out those companies, I mean, just another thought. I'm not saying this is the ultimate answer or, or even the best answer, but it's better than what we've done, is that we could have, um, you, you know, we could have made the government motors, make them to make solar panels, and uh, we could have put solar panels in every single house in this entire country um, if we could buy solar panels in bulk. I was estimating that, you know, they would cost about $20,000 per household times like, a, a, I forgot how, how many, mil, it was like, a, maybe it was 120 million households, but then you could also, you could also have it like a progressive system, so if their house is worth more than like, you know, $200,000, and then they, they, you know, they would just get a subsidy instead of just the full amount, but it would employ a lot of people. Plus, it, once this is done, it would take probably about 10, 20 years to finish this project. I mean, you have solar panels that are built to last like 30 years, and, and who knows, maybe we could like enhance them as well. But basically, you know, you would have um, that many households that no longer have electric bills, and um, so, you, you, you know, this would pay for itself, and, and, that's, and, and plus it would reduce demand for oil, and um, which would lower... Um, prices for groceries, and uh, it would make a cleaner environment. I mean, it seems like a win-win-win all the way around. But yes, anything that we do, anything that we do to divest ourselves of fossil fuels uh, and, and create uh, renewable energy for our people and our country is a, a benefit not only immediately, but for decades into the future, decades into the future. Well, all right, that's so much for that one. Uh, the, the number two was H.R. Uh, 676, the health care bill. Uh, uh, the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, which is uh, uh, an oxymoron, it, it, it's not affordable, and it hardly is going to contribute to health care. Yeah, it's like that Clean Skies Act that Bush did or whatever. R right. Yeah. Um, that, the, the number of pages in that act was well over 2,000. It was written in conjunction with the pharmaceutical and insurance industries. That's who sponsored the writing I I behind the closed doors of the White House. And, the, and there were real names associated with it. I'll, I'll give you one name, Billy Towson. People don't know that name. Billy Towson was a congressman from Louisiana. When he was in the Congress, he was a shill for the pharmaceutical lobbies. When he retired, he became the leading lobbyist for the pharmaceutical lobbies. He was called in by Rahm Emanuel, his buddy, to, to help write an act that would be sponsored. And he was a Republican, too, right? No, uh, he was a Democrat. Okay. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but he was, he was uh, used uh, because he knew that uh, so many of the, of the people in 
government in the Congress were bought off by the uh, by the f insurance industry, which is part of the finance industry. Um, and and of course, if it makes money for the insurance companies, they're going to vote for it because that's what what the insurance companies put them in office to do. Yeah, this is a bad deal. I mean, it's a real bad deal. If I mean, if you had an agent working for you and, and they gave you this kind of deal to sign, um, you know, you'd probably fire them, right? Um, and well, I surely wouldn't sign on to it. Yeah. On the other hand, a bill was introduced in 2009. The number is H.R. 676. Remember, people who are listening, don't believe me. You can look at the bill yourself. Go to thomas.loc.gov. Thomas, the name thomas.loc.gov. What is thomas.loc.gov? It's the government's own website. You can look up any bill for any Congress. <coughs> Punch into the search engine, HR 676, and the bill will come up. You can look at it. It was introduced in 2009. It is co-sponsored by 80 different congressmen, and nothing happened to it except that it was relegated to a committee, and there it has sat, because it doesn't have the votes enough from unowned congressmen to get out of committee and to be presented on the floor. And what does it do? It enacts something called PNHP, the Physicians National Health Program. It was written not by the insurance companies or the pharmaceutical companies, but by the doctors themselves. It is comprehensive health care for every American citizen at 5.5% of income. That means that if you're earning $50,000 a year for 2500 bucks, everything is paid for everything. There are no co-pays. And what is paid for? Doctors, hospitals, eye care, dental care, prosthetic care, long-term care. I could go on and on and on. And the what does that mean for a lot of businesses that won't have to, you know, pay for health care for it, their employees? It would save our small businesses. One of the great hypocrisies of the Republican Party is that they say, oh, we got to protect our small businesses. And whenever I have a debate with a Republican, I say, okay, so let's pass 676. And they say, oh, no, we don't want socialized medicine. That's socialized medicine. And they can still get their own private insurance if there's ones that are competing in the market, right? I, I mean, um, I think the big argument against, uh, you know, people that don't want any government programs is, is this. If you can convince them that it's voluntary and that it pays for itself. This is not a government program. Yeah. It's not a government program. People can choose their own doctors. They can choose their own hospitals. It was written by the physicians of the United States. And it pays for itself, right? I mean, it probably pays dividends mm -hmm. if if you if if you know the numbers. I, I mean, so I mean, I think that's got to be you, you know one of the the main arguments as far well, as well. It's not only that, but it doesn't make money for the insurance of the pharmaceutical companies. If you there there is hardly any sane person in the United States who has read through the entire Obamacare bill. I have never claimed to be sane, and I have read through the entire bill. And I have two doctorates, and I don't understand a lot of it, because it's written in language that's designed to be uh, ob obtuse. In any event, if you get to section 7002 of the Obama health care bill, and you can get it online, you can get it from thomas.loc.gov. It's called the Affordable Health Care Act. You can read that section, 7002, and what you'll find out is that that section was written to protect the pharmaceutical industry. What it does is it doubles the life of a drug until a generic form of the drug can be put on the market. Doubles the life of a drug, which means that the pharmaceutical companies are going to make trillions of dollars right. more. It, it, it lengthens the time of the patents. Um, yes. And, and, and so patents were there originally to reward, um, you, you know, the inventor, but it's also wasn't meant to last forever. Um, and deliberately. Wasn't yeah, meant to deliberately last was not meant to last forever. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what if someone had a cure for cancer? I mean, do you think it would be right for them to forever suppress that from the whole rest of the world? Well, in any event, the, the, uh, H.R. 676 does not do that. And so H.R. 676 is not 2,000 pages long. It's 18 pages long. And you can easily read it. And there's no reason on earth why an honest government 
should not pass that bill. It should at least come out of committee and be debated openly on the floor of the House. Yeah, 18 at the very pages, least. that's the kind of you know legislation it seems like that we've been missing for a long time. Yeah, we have. All right, so much for, for that one. And the first one was uh, taxes. In 1960, the corporations of the United States were responsible for 24% of all federal revenue raised, 24%. Today, it is responsible for a little more than 8%. The balance has been shifted to the middle class. In other words, corporate taxes have gone down over 300% since 1960. Over 300%. So I would like to restore the taxes of 1960 to half their value. Half their value. Just half of what was just, in Just half. And... And the richest Americans, the richest 1% of Americans in 1960 paid 75% in income taxes. I would go back to half of that. So like 38.5%. Exactly. Instead of, instead of a guy like Mitt Romney paying a smaller percentage than his secretary pays. I think that's better than what we have now. I mean, I think eventually we don't want to be, you know, dependent completely on big corporations anyways, but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's probably, at least till we get out of this debt, debt that we're in, you know. Um. Yes, yeah, so there, well, there's only one way that we're going to get out of this debt, and, and, and that's for responsible people to lower spending and to increase revenue, and the revenue should be increased by those who have gotten the biggest breaks over the last 50 years. Now, another thing we could do, I mean, what do you think, I mean, about the Federal Reserve? I mean, should that have at least more oversight, but should it not only be a um, public department? Absolutely more oversight, absolutely open uh, um, meetings, uh, viewed by the public, uh, transcribed for the public, uh, and, and I believe uh, without the power to print money, that they can recommend it, but Congress is enacted with that power. That's a constitutional role of Congress that has been usurped. And it is not, it's not, it's simply not constitutional. I, I don't know why we stand for all of this stuff. I don't know why we stand for unconstitutional behavior. I don't know why the American people, well, it's one of the reasons why I wrote the I American think slow covenant. to anger, and, um, you, you know, but we eventually, you know, the sleeping giant will eventually wake up. It takes a while for it to, but um, it will happen um, quickly. Uh, or, or, it, or they don't wake up, or they don't wake up, and they collapse. Right, right. Those, it's not always a happy scenario at the end. It, it's unknown, but, um, you know, that's what, what we're fighting for, and, and you know, five people... In, in your district tells five people and, and even if you know you have some money to donate and, and you want to put it to a good cause even if you're not in Pennsylvania I would say that you know this is an investment in the future because it will affect um, y y you know uh, the laws that you live under and uh, so what about um, the two topics we I didn't touch but um, yet it's just real quickly um, you, you know the the drug war or the policies how we're conducting it now and also abortion you know pro-life pro-choice uh, let's save abortion till the end because it's an enormously complex issue. The drug war is a fiasco because we have made it, we have dealt with it in the same way that we dealt with prohibition and it didn't work. I am a drug addict, except that I am not addicted to drugs that are illegal. I happen to be recovering from open heart surgery and I'm a diabetic. In order to get my fix, all I have to do is go to my doctor and get a prescription. And I can go into the pharmacy, and I can get the drugs that keep me alive. And they do. They keep me alive. If I had to go to the underground for those drugs, it would not only cost me a hundred times more than I'm paying now, which is a, a fortune anyway, but it would make me a criminal. The same thing is true with people who are addicted to so-called illegal drugs. We should put the narcotics problem in the hands of our physicians. It is a medical problem. It is not a political problem. It's a medical problem. And the irony of how we are treating it now is that by supporting Hamid Karzai and his brother, we, who take 
the, the most drugs in the world, the most heroin and and and, and sn sniffing and sifting and, yeah, and smoking. Yeah, all the derived and, drugs from heroin. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all of that. We are funding. The, we are funding the narcotics industry by our buying habits, just like we funded the uh, alcohol industry by our buying habits. And during Prohibition, it was not only funding the alcohol industry, it was funding the underworld. It was funding organized crime. Oh, yeah. The underground crime doesn't want it legal. It's just like alcohol prohibition, I would say. It's, 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 it's as, as far as something could, you know, be kind of a twin situation, it's very, very similar. Um, it's, it's, it's a scientific study. It's a double-blind study. We tried it with alcohol. The same results are happening with um, marijuana. And uh, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's yeah, we, it's, it's not constructive. There's people that are in prison and families split up, and um, it, it costs too much and it just you know it's a war against some drugs and um, it just doesn't make sense it's it, it's 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 a lose-lose and um, so all right well now I was gonna also ask yeah abortion ahead. abortion yeah the most difficult problem that I have faced in my thinking um, how do I explain this I am not in favor of abortion certainly not as a form of birth control However, the government has no right, none, no constitutional right, no right of any kind to force a woman to choose what they want a woman to choose in terms of her reproductive behavior, which is why I am pro-choice. I am not pro-abortion. I don't know if any, anyone else. It's kind of the there. same thing with drugs. I mean, you don't want women in back alleys getting abortions, right? Of course not. Yes, all you do is drive it underground or, or make it unavailable to poor people, unavailable to rich people, or unavailable to people who can't leave the country to go to a country where abortion is legal and only make it available to people who can't afford a plane ride to France or wherever. Yeah. But, but, but even more than that, there is the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution. People will find out what I'm saying again uh, if they read the, my book, which is the American Covenant. The Ninth Amendment says the following. It's one sentence. I'm going to quote it. The enumeration of, uh, uh, in, in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That's all it says. What others? It doesn't say. What do you use to deny or disparage? It doesn't say. Does it mean that a woman has jurisdiction over her own reproductive choices? It doesn't say. If you say no, I have to ask you why. If you say yes, I have to ask you why. And your answer has to be constitutional and not religious, because you cannot use a religious argument to create a law. That is a fundamental principle of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Now, this is the Ninth Amendment, part of our Bill of Rights. People don't talk about it. Yeah, People, I hardly ever hear about, you know, I always hear about the first, the second, the fourth. Um, never heard, really heard too much about the ninth. Well, you can, look at, you can look it up and you can, uh, and I, I tr trust me, or no, wait a second, don't trust me. Look it up, get a copy of the Constitution, read the Ninth Amendment for yourself. It's one lousy sentence, and I quoted it exactly. Now... Let me, let me say one more thing about abortion before people who hear me go off the deep end with this your anti-God and all of that stuff argument, none of which applies to uh, a pluralistic democracy and certainly not our pluralistic democracy. There are situations in life in which irreconcilable conflicts are necessary and cannot admit to a moral argument which justifies one side or another. Let me give you an example outside of the human kingdom. What is the moral argument between the gazelle and the lion on the African plain? If you were going to legislate the killing on the African plain, if you prevent the lion from killing the gazelle, the lion starves to death. If you prevent the gazelle from constantly running away from the... Uh, if you pr uh, prevent the uh, lion from killing the gazelle, the lion starves to death. If you insist that the lion kill, kills the gazelle, the gazelle 
becomes ex extinct. There is no moral argument in a situation in which there is an irreconcilable conflict between lives. In certain instances, human rep repercussion, human, re uh, not repercussion, human uh, reproduction has irreconcilable arguments. If the if the if the well-being of the mother and the well-being of the child are in conflict, if if by the way there are four entities in the in the case of abortion, there's mother, there's father, there's society, and there's child. <coughs> they do not have to be in harmony all the time. In fact, many instances they're not in harmony, and when they are not in harmony, someone is going to get hurt. Someone is going to lose in that argument. The choice is usually between the mother and the fetus. It, it's, that's part of life. That's part of the way decisions come down in the pluses and minuses of life. If a woman is going to die in childbirth, and I know that, and that woman is my wife, I don't want anyone in the government anywhere near the decision that I would have to make. I don't want you near it. I don't want Mitt Romney near it. I don't want Ob Barack Obama near it. I don't want the Pope near it. I don't want anyone near it except me and my decisions and my doctors. That's it. And who I would choose, I have no idea. I thank God never been in that situation. But it is a situation which should be left up to the people most directly involved, not to the government, not to the churches. Yeah, that's a very thoughtful answer. Um, Read the book. Read the book. It's an answer which I told you this was the... It took me 35 years to write The American Covenant. 35 years of research, of thinking, of attending classes. It is not an ill-conceived book. Read why I have come to that opinion. But whatever opinion I've come to, it should have no business in the halls of government, none. Yeah, that no, that sounds very reasonable to me. Um, and um, even if someone disagreed, I mean, they they have that right, and uh, and they I don't think they could argue that it's not, you, you know, that you didn't analyze this and and were thoughtful about it. And um, and so I think you're right, though. We, we it's, it, lot, people don't really hundred percent know. Um, you, you know, when life begins, I guess that's part of the debates, but... Um, Not for me. Yeah. No, I answer that question in the book. Not for me. Okay. And also, a lot of people have never had, uh, have never been struck with the tragedy of abortion. I have, as a teacher, several times. Right, and like you said, that's a decision that, like, that the people directly involved should be making. I, I mean, and um, so... I, can, I, could, I could tell you situations where a child was made to carry to term when she did not want to and ended up, before the baby was born, by hanging herself from the tree in her backyard, killing herself and her baby. I don't want to be responsible for that kind of thing. I, it's, 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 she was not counseled correctly. She was certainly not treated correctly by her parents. Yeah, it's a human being that I government knew. Government isn't the answer to everything. It, it is not the answer at all to this. Yeah. Not at all to this. By the way, um, there's a great definition of life given by, uh, by a cosmic biologist who was studying uh, what could comprise life on another planet where it's not hydrocarbon based or might not be hydrocarbon based. This is his definition and I accept it. I use it in the question of abortion. That is a life which is capable of maintaining or increasing its order. Our order is cellular. If the, in, if the entity involved can maintain its cellular order or increase its cellular order, it is alive. By that definition, a fetus is alive from the moment of conception. It needs a host, but it's alive. Okay. Which is why I give the fetus full rights in the democracy. Full rights. But the fetus can't make its own decision, and that's where the problem is. No, it, 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 you're, that, that, make, that makes sense to me. And uh, Well, one, one closing question that we usually do is, um, who, who is someone that you've been, uh, that's been on your mind recently that, um, that you've been thinking about? Um, could be someone that uh, you, you, know, you find inspiring or someone you just d detest, but just someone that uh, is interesting and, and why, sir? 
Well, I've been thinking about Bill Bradley recently because I've read his book. In fact, I'm going to vote for him for president, even though he's not running. Uh, I, I am not going to fall into the pattern of having to choose between the fire and the frying pan. That's a nonsensical argument. Well, there's Pe Jill Stein and Gary Johnson. and you know. Yeah, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people. But I happen to know Bradley, and, and, and I know what he stands for. I know what kind of person he is, and I would trust my country with him. I don't know any of the other people, but I know what Bradley is, and I know what he believes because he's bothered to tell me in a book. Anyway, he's one of the people that I think about. Who else have I thought about? I, besides uh, the pitching rotation of the New York Yankees? I don't know. I, th I think about the, the people in politics now, and I'm just sickened by them, which is why I'm running. I'm sickened by them. There aren't many voices that speak to me anymore. Beethoven speaks to me. Mahatma Gandhi speaks to me. Albert Einstein speaks to me. I have the greatest respect for him. Oh, wonderful. A wonderful guy. Yeah, he's had a couple of books, too. And uh, Well, uh, Steve, it's been a pleasure. And um, so, I mean, again, common sense. We do have a choice um, to, to do something different, to make it a November to remember. And, uh, y you know, um, to well, the people in this district have a choice. They really do. Yeah. Yeah. A, a shot heard around the world would be, uh, y you know, you winning the election, I think. Um, it uh, would be a shot heard around the world. And, and to, I'll be very honest with you. If I got to Congress, what would I be able to do? Nothing. I'd be there with a target on my back with uh, 434 other crooks saying, don't give him a secretary who can type. Don't sponsor any of his bills. I don't care what they'd say. Well, you'd have people behind you, I think, if you were loud enough and um, people could hear you. And, and, yes. and it, it might be enough to make other people stand up. And maybe in 2014, we can get even more people. I mean, it may take 10 years to get our country back, but we can do it slowly every two years in the House of Representatives. That's one strategy that I see that has the least path of path of resistance. And, um, so and I agree 100% with what you said. Exactly right. You are exactly right. And that's the value that I could have if I were elected, that any third party candidate could help, could have if they were elected, to present alternatives, any of which would be better than the corruption that we vote for. All right. Very well said. And, um, well, I'll say goodbye to you real quick after this interview. Thank you for your time, Stephen, and, um, or Steve, and, uh, you know, we'll um, uh, see what happens on November 6th and, uh, and, and you, you know, see what people choose. Thank you very much for having me.